This video describes the input modes supported by the CITF or input module. The input for the positive pin can be configured to analog voltage input with a range of impedances, either no resistance on the input, a pull-up resistance, a pull-down resistance, or the input can be measured differentially between the IO- and IO- pins. On the schematic you can see we have two circuits with two input pins and a ground. This is used to indicate the general schematic for the configuration being used. The higher pin is the positive pin, the lower pin is the negative pin. The resistance that is used to set the differential or single-ended resistance is typed into the RL field and you must press the enter to send this value to the hardware. The value will then change to show you the value achieved and as a general rule the lower the resistance you type in the more accurately we can achieve that value. Let's choose a 1 kilo ohm pull to ground single-ended analog input. Once you have set up your input loading you can choose to change the input gain. For the positive input you can change the gain between a, a plus or minus 60 volt range, a plus or minus 30 volt range, a plus or minus 7.5 volt range or a plus or minus 1.5 range. We're going to use the 30 volt range for this short demonstration. Note that when we've changed our range, at the bottom of this frame we get a message telling us the configuration we've chosen. So here it says 30 volt analog voltage input with 1002 ohms pull down. So this summarizes the mode that we've currently chosen here. Now that we've configured the IO plus pin on the module, we can choose to configure the IO minus pin. Provided the IO plus pin has configured single-endedly, then we've got no real restrictions on the IO minus pin configuration, and so this can be configured as analog voltage input, digital input, frequency input, digital output, or PWM output. As we're discussing analog inputs, I will turn on the analog input on the minus pin as well. Here there are some restrictions in that the pull up and pull down must always be in the same state for both the plus and the minus pin. And for the IO minus pin, analog input voltage range is fixed at plus or minus 60 volts. The load resistance is also fixed on the IO minus pin to a 15 kilo ohm resistance. If you require different resistor values, consider using a different channel's plus pin or putting a parallel resistance where required. Again, in the same way as the plus pin, there is a summary description of the input mode that has been configured for the IO minus pin here. Now let's look at an input connected to the module. To view the IO data, it's possible to view the data briefly looking at these fields above the schematic, but a better way of doing this is to view the data in a graphical mode or a meter display mode. I'll choose the graphical mode. Here you can see the key shows us the green channel is for the plus volts and the blue key shows us that's the minus signal. I'm going to put a slow sine wave input on the plus pin. Here you can see the green signal reflecting the plus pin now is showing us the value that I've applied. If I want to increase the scale then I can just drag down this handle here on the scope to show you the signal. You notice here that my signal is going slightly negative 
and so I can offset that using my signal generator just to show the voltage changing. If we have signals applied that are bipolar and going negative then it's possible to change the graph display to be a bipolar display like so. And here we can also increase the uh, gain by moving the handles on the scope like so. And zero in unipolar mode is at the bottom and in bipolar mode is in the center. Sometimes the signals change over a long period of time and so you need to change the period of time for the strip chart and to do this we can move these handles here. In fact it's also possible to move the window to look at an earlier period of time like so. To do that you drag the center between the two handles. The right hand handle is the end time, the left hand handle is the start time of the display. Now that we've configured the IO module to measure an analog voltage on the plus and minus pin, in most cases we need to set the channel up to stream the data over the CAN bus for measurement by other systems such as real-time targets. To do that we need to configure the I.O. rate for the module to be a certain rate to allow measurement. Try and choose a slower rate as is practical for the test application to minimize loading the CAN bus too highly. In this case, I'm going to set the I.O. rate to 100 milliseconds. I have to type in 100 in the Genix I.O. rate field and make sure that the stream checkbox is turned on. A value of 0 in this field with stream turned on will effectively turn off the streaming. So I will press enter and now the module has been configured to stream data every 100 milliseconds. Having configured the module to stream every 100 milliseconds, I'm now going to stop the user interface and run a CAN monitor to view the data being sent. If I go on bus, you can now see that every 100 milliseconds there is a new message being sent from that channel with the analog data. If I disconnect my analog input, you'll see that the numbers stop changing very much. Clearly there's a small change in the signal due to um, the fact that it's an analog signal, but if I reconnect the signal again, the numbers will change more significantly. Returning to our real-time user interface, we can run, connect to CRTF, and you can see we are back where we were before. One note about Genix IO rate is whilst it is possible to set very fast rates such as one millisecond, this is fine but remember that there is a limited bandwidth for the CAN channel and if you have too many channels, no more than eight in fact, uh, can be achieved physically over a one meg connection then um, you have to be careful about this. If we return to our CAN man monitor, uh, you can now see that we're getting lots more CAN data. And in fact, if you look at the bus statistics, I'm loading it up about 29% with the GUI connected as well as the CAN message being sent. So we would recommend values of, say, 10 millisecond or lower for uh, reasonable band uh, bandwidth. So here 4% is now being used with a 10 millisecond and the GUI. If I stop the GUI you'll notice that the, the statistics drop 
but still we're using around 2% of the bandwidth with a 10 milliseconds. So we can run theoretically 50 channels at 10 milliseconds. But this is probably unnecessary in many cases where we're monitoring signals such as temperature sensors or slowly changing signals that do not require high response. So let's wrap up this analog input demonstration on the CITF module. We'll run the GUI again and finally just put a DC signal into the system. So it's a put in a voltage of around uh, 10 volts or so. In fact there is a small amount of um, AC still applied to this because my signal generator uh, can't apply a DC signal. Uh, but just to show the meter display that it is possible to um, measure the voltage using um, the meter. Now if I increase the frequency to make this look a little bit perhaps more like noise then um, you can see we're getting around 10.2 but if I turn off the smoothing, then the actual AC signal being applied from the signal generator is showing a lot of variation. So switching on the smoothing is quite a good way of looking at the average voltage. This is, this is useful if you have a noisy signal. You can see here the raw signal and the smooth signal using the meter. So the last step that is required to make use of the CAN data that was um, configured earlier is to export a CAN database. In this case we're going to export our CAN database to the h3genixsystem.dbc file and by exporting this CAN data we can now use this CAN database in other systems such as um, real-time targets. So finally, let's just look at that CAN database and uh, explain how this correlates to the data being sent from the module. These values across the top help to explain the CAN database quite well. The value being sent from the module for all the configurations available are this value is called the primary value and this value is called the secondary value. These left fields relate to the positive side and the same is true on the right hand side. This is the primary minus signal, the secondary minus signal and these last fields are an integer that describes whether it's an analog voltage, a current, a frequency or raw value. So one represents an analog signal and the value is sent over the CAN bus uh, in a single CAN message. Having exported our CAN DB earlier, I'm going to now load this in a CAN database editor. For this I'm going to use the Kavasa CAN database editor, as most of our customers are using Kavasa CAN cables. This database editor is freely available from Kvasa's website for those using Kvasa hardware. So let's open the database that we generated and if we expand down the left hand side you can see that the messages included are relatively simple. We have a get device status message that tells us if we're having any input overloads, any resistance protection and so on and also uh, the primary plus and minus, secondary plus and minus and readback type signals that I mentioned on the user interface earlier. So you can see that the names used are sensibly named to match the pod and the channel number. So IP is input, 0 is channel 0 and if we were to connect these signals using a real-time target then every 100 milliseconds in our example from earlier we would be receiving that data. In the case of the analog value you have a choice of reading the primary output or the secondary output 
The primary output is in fact slightly lower resolution than the secondary output. So depending on whether you want a high resolution or a lower resolution signal, you can choose which of those two fields to use. If you're using MATLAB Simulink, then uh, we can provide a block set uh, free of charge that will interpret the signals from the CAN database uh, and output appropriately scaled analog voltages or frequencies depending on the mode that has been used. That ends the demonstration for the GenX CITF analog input modes.